Diuretics are used in the management of hypertension, CHF, and certain kidney diseases, among other conditions. They are classified according to their mechanism of action. In this animation, we will review the physiology of glomerular filtration, regional transport, and the mechanism of action of diuretics. Here are some of the major organs impacted by proper functioning of the kidney. Let's zoom in on the kidney. Here, we see the renal artery arising from the abdominal aorta. The renal artery supplies blood to the kidney and adrenal gland. Major functions of the kidney include removal of waste products from the circulation, balance of fluids, electrolytes, and metabolites, and ensuring homeostasis by regulating the amount of water and solutes excreted in the urine. The parenchyma of the kidney is divided into an outer cortex and an inner medulla. We will now zoom in on the nephron, the functional unit of the kidney, and focus in on the glomerulus. In normal glomerular filtration, blood flows from the renal artery to afferent arterioles. It then travels through glomerular capillaries, where a filtration occurs. The filtrate passes through the proximal tubule, where most filtered substances are reabsorbed back into circulation. What remains unfiltered in the blood continues on through the efferent arteriole. Now that we have reviewed glomerular filtration, let's proceed to regional transport and the mechanism of action of diuretics. Let's take a closer look at the proximal tubule, the portion of the nephron that is most active in reabsorption and is the site of action for carbonic and hydrase inhibitors. Carbon dioxide easily diffuses from the lumen of the proximal tubule into epithelial cells. Once inside, carbon dioxide binds to water, and with the help of carbonic and hydrase II, carbonic acid is formed. It then dissolves to form hydrogen and bicarbonate. Next, this hydrogen is exchanged with sodium through a channel known as the sodium hydrogen antiporter, or exchanger, labeled here as NHE3. Once in the lumen, hydrogen ions bind to bicarbonate to form carbonic acid. Carbonic and hydrase 4 then cleaves carbonic acid to form water and carbon dioxide. Meanwhile, the bicarbonate from the breakdown of carbonic acid is reabsorbed into the circulation through sodium bicarbonate co-transport channels, or NBC1, followed by sodium. Thus, for every hydrogen ion excreted, one bicarbonate ion is reabsorbed into the circulation. On the basolateral border of proximal tubule cells, the sodium-potassium ATPase pump exchanges three sodium ions for every two potassium ions. This creates the sodium gradient that's used by the sodium proton antiporter. Due to this concentration gradient, potassium ions within epithelial cells diffuse freely through potassium channels into the circulation. The Mechanism of Action of Carbonic and Hydrase Inhibitors Carbonic and hydrase plays a key role in sodium and bicarbonate reabsorption, as well as acid secretion in the proximal tubule. Again, carbon dioxide easily diffuses across the membrane into epithelial cells to bind water with the help of carbonic and hydrase II. Carbonic and hydrase inhibitors, or CAI, such as acetazolamide, bind to carbonic and hydrase and prevent the formation of carbonic acid. Therefore, the sodium exchange with hydrogen, described earlier, is prevented, which will affect subsequent formation of carbonic acid in the lumen. This will cause decreased reabsorption of sodium and bicarbonate from the lumen, which can result in metabolic acidosis. The filtrate leaves the Bowman capsule and passes through the proximal convoluted tubule to reach the loop of Enli. The loop of Enli dips into the medulla. Let's take a closer look. The medulla has an osmotic gradient dependent upon salt and urea absorption. 
This osmotic gradient creates a countercurrent transport that allows the descending loop of Inlay to be selectively permeable to water. As water is being absorbed, the osmolarity inside the loop increases. Meanwhile, the opposite occurs within the ascending loop, where there is a reverse in permeability. This region of the nephron is known as the diluting segment, since there is salt retention instead of water. This is where the concentration gradient regenerates. Let's now review the mechanism of action of osmotic diuretics. An osmotic diuretic, such as mannitol, is mainly used in the treatment of cerebral edema, glaucoma, oliguric states, and to enhance the clearance of certain toxins, such as in rhabdomyolysis. Once mannitol, labeled here as MN, gets filtered through the glomerulus, it is unable to be reabsorbed. Therefore, it increases the osmolarity and the oncotic pressure inside the tubule, thus inhibiting water reabsorption. Although this drug acts on the entire tubule, its primary site of action is within the proximal tubule. Let's take a closer look at the thick ascending limb. Here, potassium and sodium dichloride are reabsorbed through a symport. Once inside the cell, sodium chloride is reabsorbed into the circulation through a sodium chloride pump along the basolateral membrane. In addition, sodium is exchanged with potassium through a sodium-potassium ATPase pump. As a result, a low intracellular sodium concentration favors the reabsorption of sodium from the lumen. Inside the cell, a high level of potassium causes it to leak back into the lumen, which creates a positive electrical potential within the lumen. Due to this positive potential, calcium and magnesium are shunted into the circulation between cells. Let's now review the action of loop diuretics. Loop diuretics, labeled here as LD, work in the thick ascending loop of Inlay by blocking the sodium-potassium dichloride symport. Thus, loop diuretics inhibit the reabsorption of sodium, potassium, and chloride, which will be lost in the urine. Furthermore, due to the loss of these ions, the lack of a positive electrical potential within the lumen will prevent the reabsorption of magnesium and calcium. Thus, they too will be lost in the urine. Let's take a closer look at the distal tubule. Sodium and chloride are reabsorbed through a sodium chloride symport. The sodium is pumped across the basal membrane via the sodium potassium ATPase in exchange for potassium. Chloride is reabsorbed into circulation due to its electrochemical gradient. Once the exchanged potassium is inside the cell, it also diffuses back into circulation. Calcium enters the cell through a parathyroid hormone dependent channel. Once inside the cell, calcium is exchanged by a sodium calcium antiporter in the basolateral membrane. The mechanism of action of thiazide diuretics will now be reviewed. Thiazides, labeled here as THZ, block the sodium chloride symport, thus inhibiting their reabsorption which will lead to a low intracellular sodium concentration. Meanwhile, calcium enters the cell through a parathyroid hormone-dependent channel. Also, sodium is pumped across some basal membrane via the sodium-potassium ATPase, leading to a low sodium intracellular concentration. This causes sodium to be exchanged for intracellular calcium by the sodium-calcium antiporter. Thus, calcium is absorbed into the blood. This is how thiazides produce hypercalcemia. Let's take a closer look at the collecting duct. The collecting duct is the main site of action for aldosterone. Aldosterone, labeled here as ALD, will enter the cell and bind with its receptor, labeled as AR. 
The major effects of aldosterone are stimulating epithelial sodium channels, thus increasing sodium reabsorption and creating a negative electrical potential within the lumen. Aldosterone also stimulates sodium-potassium ATPase pumps, allowing sodium to enter into the blood and potassium into the cell. Due to the negative electrical potential within the lumen, potassium is secreted through ungated channels. We will now review the mechanism of action of spironolactone. Spironolactone, labeled here as SPL, is a potassium sparing agent that blocks the aldosterone receptor, inhibiting its effects. This will decrease sodium reabsorption and thus prevent the loss of potassium.